Welcome to Show Studio. The season is over, so we've all finally had a chance to have some sleep and relax and reflect a little bit, which is good because we're going to sort of come back and reevaluate everything that was happening at London Fashion Week and talk about the highs and the lows and the themes that came out of this season and what issues it made us think about whether that's you know trends that came out of it or just general musings on how fashion is being sort of shown and presented and consumed. And um, I've got an amazing set of panelists with me to help unpick um, what was going on. So before we start. Um, discussing and dissecting, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Charlie. So I'm Charlie Byrne, I'm a fashion writer at The Times. Hilary Alexander, I'm a freelance fashion writer. I'm Bertie Brandis, I am a freelancer and I also run a magazine called The Mosh Pit. I'm Tallulah Harlick, I'm an actor and a fashion contributor at Pop Magazine. I'm going to start with a, um, I'll throw it out there so anyone can answer, whoever's feeling brave. What were the highlights of London this season, or is that too difficult? You're smiling too, that's <laughs> like, you <laughs> can't answer. That was like Cheshire Cat B. You know what I always say. My main man, <laughs> the man who I would make my boyfriend, I love him in his work so much. <laughs> JW. Fellow actor, JW. Yeah, JW. What's so great about him? Oh, I just think... He's just, gorgeous looking. He's he is very nice. nice. <laughs> I think there's a bit of an actor vibe that I'm like, just pick up off him. But effectively, I mean, I really loved his trousers, which aren't in those shots, but the trousers were amazing. I don't know if you can see at all because style.com, I don't think we'll have them. The backs of the trousers, they were Yeah, cut. the buttons. So yeah. amazingly, yeah. Yeah, he took that to Lueve, which I know isn't London, but it was brilliant and it was the kind of the most feminine collection that I've seen him do which worked and I thought was really interesting and mm. kind of I just want to get my hands on it and style it for pop now. Mm. Well it's an interesting one isn't it because I feel like this was such an example of what London does quite nicely which is that kind of you go this way I'll go that way you say this about me I'll prove you wrong. And yeah. I feel like what this was about and we talked about this on the panel that we did for the show was the sense of people said that his clothes were sexless and didn't work to the female form and then he did something that was incredibly sensual and yeah. I found that quite interesting just on one hand but also it's quite fun to see a designer kind of do a little bit of a kind of combative design process where he's like hang on if you say I'm this I'll, I'll go in a different direction. Did, did you guys enjoy the JW show? I, I like the way there was a sort of nautical, vague nautical thread especially yeah. in those trousers you were talking mm. about you know with the buttons at the back and you know sometimes there were hints of rope and things like that but the print here and there. it was all then mishmashed around into something completely different so it wasn't your conventional navy and white mm. it was very very clever and also I thought it was quite very French yeah oh. but I think that's an element of it felt like a collection which is kind of also about him growing up and he's got this amazing new position at Lebeve and I think you know he has to kind of put himself on that level where he's beyond London now yeah, yeah, yeah it felt more that. mature definitely yeah did you like it Bertie? yeah I liked it I think it's clever I mean if somebody's gonna throw around the word nautical that would normally make me shudder mm. quite horribly yeah. <laughs> and he managed to take nautical and make it super super cool as he always does like JW is always really cool I love those big buttons I've got to say I'm not like obsessed with the hats but the buttons I think great we're great it's interesting isn't it when you say kind of usually if someone said nautical it would make you shudder because I felt yeah. a bit when we were just talking about this on the New York panel I felt like it was kind of the season of um like kind of quite mindless obvious references but used in a really interesting way we were talking about it with Mark Jacobs doing military you know it's just mm. like oh my god and everyone doing yeah, the 70s mm. and granted some examples of people doing the 70s were mindless and horrible but a lot of it was kind of done in a really intelligent way it was taking something yeah as you say like nautical which you'd, you'd yawn if you got a press release before the show started and it was nautical mm. and I think that was quite an interesting thing this idea of taking kind of fashion cliches and fashion tropes and doing it in an interesting way I wonder if there's a kind of a humour to that but well, I think maybe that's even come from the fact that last season we had so much, you know, obvious branding and we had the Kellogg's bags and the, you know, there's that humour keeps, seems to still be developing the whole time. Mm. It's almost looking for, it's the whole time, isn't it? You're looking for new ways of doing things when realistically there are very few new yeah. ways of doing things. So I think maybe that's it. It's coming from that commercialism almost. Mm. It's interesting. I like, sorry, here we go. No, I was just going to say, I like the way that it was sort of girly. Yeah. But in a very JW way. Mm. And yet, when you look at see, look at that little pink suit, for example. I mean, yeah. that really is really cute, but not cute. See, no, not twee. No, no, not twee. Really, you know, fun. Mm. Let's talk more about that that idea of kind of fun and wit because it's something that I've been thinking a lot about at the moment. I do think it's interesting because 
I sometimes think when fashion tries to be funny, and it's interesting that you mentioned kind of like the Kellogg bags and things mm. like that that we're seeing so much of, it can feel really kind of empty and a bit awkward. Do we like it when fashion tries to be funny? When it is, when it is successful, or mm. well, when it's clever. I mean, yeah. I know yeah. going back to the last time I was here, we were talking about Prada and Prada, and Nietzsche is drawn to something that she sort of hates and then she'll make it really cool mm. and that's kind of the same thing so you're drawn to nautical which is such an endless cliche but you make it cool it's kind of different to just all that excessive branding where you're trying to find humor in fashion but it all feels kind of empty and it doesn't yeah doesn't work for me personally I think this is much more intelligent yeah it's not so obvious exactly mm. it's much yeah. more subtle but the wit isn't kind of laughing at fashion sometimes that obvious branding it's like who's the joke on yeah. is it on your shopper is it on or is it the idiot who paid god knows how much forever you know I know what you mean yeah. but for me in a direct example that Kellogg's like they that kind of branding where it's so obvious wasn't for me where the clever bit was it was things like the crisp packet bag yeah where it was yeah. unbranded and really plain but the, the really humor concept was there that to yeah. me is the clever bit okay that's interesting you but you still have to ask yourself you know bad. who would pay you know yeah. three or four grand to look like a packet of crisp yes yeah. <laughs> you do you know? that's Katie the big Perry. question that we should Lots of people <laughs> look to fit. That's quite a good summary of fashion. That's the big question. Who would say yeah. for grand? Should just of... end the panel now? Yeah, yeah we're done. And we're out. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's an interesting one. But I feel like um, what we saw a lot of from London this season was I felt like it was a real sense of kind of clothes that didn't make you look like an idiot. They were mm. kind of clothes mm. that were quite sympathetic or empathetic or sensitive to a shopper and to how she wants to dress. And it wasn't so much about the designer going, here is my vision, I'm going to place it upon the body. It was more about kind of trying to have this quite respectful dialogue with a shopper, which mm. I thought was quite interesting. Do you know where I thought that kind of concept was most obvious? Strangely enough, perhaps, was at Julian McDonald, <laughs> which, you know, normally, you know what it's going to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. slash to here, cut up to here, yep. see-through, backless, <clears throat> sideless, frontless. Yeah. But there was actually a kind of um, restrained modesty. Yeah. And it really, some of his pieces actually look really, really quite nice. But I think it's interesting. Almost like Valentino. Well, this is associated with Valentino because I feel like they, like the influence of Valentino, I think, was felt across London. This idea of like modesty and primness mm. is so interesting. And I feel like, you know, I feel like in a way, London is the city for red carpet dressing now and cocktail wear. And um, all that kind of like high neck, like I'm going to look like a little pretty kind of Catholic schoolgirl, but I'm wearing this amazing gown. That was mm. kind of really pervasive. It was quite an interesting one. I thought I think there was a lot of people that were doing that. What was it, what was everyone else's highlights? Because we've stuck on J Dub. Claire Barrow. Claire oh, Barrow. Love her. Bloody love her. Why do you like her? She's so just much? cool. Like her show wasn't like a show. It's all so hand drawn and like I just, I just think it's great. It's so different. Mm. Um, I, I think her. my favourite was Barbara Casasola. Yeah? It was it's very different to Claire Barrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've <laughs> leapt. It was wonderful. I mean, it was because she's Brazilian, so she kind of used Brazilian architecture and the swimsuit. Yeah. But then it was the most wonderful pleated metallic kind of slinky skirts and mm. kind of tank tops in copper and bronze and pewter, and you just thought, Yeah. Yes. It's two interesting contradictions there, actually, with putting someone like Claire Barrow against someone like Barbara because I think what is really interesting is it shows kind of how interesting London's become as a city because not to kind of say that Claire isn't remotely sort of like on her way to building a very successful brand and I think she is definitely going that way but she's much more of a focus on that kind of like craft and subculture mm -hmm. and niche whereas something like Barbara it's interesting that she shows in London but mm. she is obviously a very commercial designer and how she approaches things she's very sort of catering to a very moneyed customer yeah. whereas Claire's much more about kind of like a cool fashion savvy girl it's interesting to see that mix in London I think you're seeing a lot more of that kind of from designers who actually had a really similar pedigree not in that example but designers who've come out of St Martin's at around a similar time so mm. you've got people like your Rock Sanders sitting alongside yeah. but you know what's interesting I feel like this season Burberry tried to get both of those things and really fell flat really because yeah. there were elements of both of them coming together and it just did not work some and the flat the, shoes. And those it was weird jackets. Wasn't it? it was just. It was a weird collection that one because I looked at it on the screen. I, I didn't go to show and I looked at all the images and I was like, oh, I quite like this. This is quite cool. And then I tried to find an image to put on social media to be like, look at the Burberry show, and I couldn't find a look that just didn't look absolutely ridiculous. No. So it was one of those ones that <laughs> like, worked as a show, really worked. And I'm sure actually it would probably work really well as pieces. But when you look at it as individual looks, it's just kind of really, really weird. Yeah, the style. Maybe so it was bizarre. the styling rather than the actual pieces. 
just don't yeah. like that denim jacket. I, that to me is really a mistake. It's a weird fluff, it's the wrong length. But I feel like this was a collection, I think this is what Christopher Bailey usually does incredibly well, mm. where he, it does feel like a collection built out of market research and trend reports and looking at what other people are doing. And usually that works really in, in an interesting way. He's like, people are interested in craft, they're interested in hand painting, we'll do that. And this season it just felt too much like, let's try and do what everyone's doing. I mean, that just looks nothing like Burberry. Mm. Yeah. yeah. No. Indistinguishable. Excuse me. <laughs> it's indistinguishable. <laughs> I don't know, you were so excited by your analysis. <laughs> I love pitching. Talking about craft, I'll tell you who really excited me. Um, there's this French girl called Faustine Steinmetz. Yeah, yeah they're think? great. And yeah. she's the first French, or the first, I think, you know, non-London-based designer. Yeah. Being um, invited onto the new gen scheme at British Fashion Council. Yeah. And she did a sort of installation in the um, ICA with models. Um, but the models just kind of stood and sort of slowly revolved and it was all hand-woven denim. Yeah. And apparently she's got a sort of yeah, antique I've seen loom. It. I've seen and the then she really distresses really. it and frays it and fringes it and it was absolutely Invisible. gorgeous. Well, really, really gorgeous. It's so interesting that you mention her in the context when we're looking at these kind of weird denim jackets denim or jacket. burberry because it feels like London is starting to be, obviously Marcus Almeida, you yes. can't, I sort of talk about denim without talking about them, but it feels like we're kind of the city that's made denim something that's kind of not just like jeans wear, something that's actually to do with fashion and to mm. do with an aesthetic. Um, what, why are we kind of owning that? Do you think it just goes back to London's idea of always kind of like questioning It's because it's luxurious. so dynamic. It's such yeah. a, it, it can be anything. Like we've seen denim can be, you could wear a denim dress with a huge shoulder bow from Marquez mm. and wear it out mm. with heels and be super glam. Or you can just wear a great pair of jeans and Converse. Mm. And that's very London. And look at your top. Thank yeah. you. This is my yeah. hair. <laughs> As demonstrated. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but did we really own that before Marquez? I don't know. Mate. No. It's more American. Mm. Denim to yeah. me so says America. But I think okay. jeans wear is America, but I think yeah. denim in fashion feels quite London. Mm. I know it's not, there's, you could, there's a huge French history with like Jean mm. Gaultier and et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like that kind of, this recent idea, because in, I interviewed Marcus Almeida on Monday on Chase Studio, have a watch. Um, <laughs> and they talk about how like in the first four, I think it was the four seasons that they said, maybe it was the first like four, no, four seasons, they didn't actually make a pair of jeans. And they were like, everyone talks mm. about us as like mm. jeans, but they were like, we used denim, we made like shirts, we made skirts, and we paired it with like kind of like little shorts and all that, they weren't actually making jeans. jeans. And I think that's what's interesting is this kind of different heritage that denim has and that now it's kind of become a fabric that you see a lot on the London runways, but not just as a kind of pair of designer denim jeans, no. which is what it was for ages. But really it's especially amazing what they've done when you think that they've, sin I mean, even on their graduate, because they were in my year in CSM and from day one, that's what they do. That you know, everybody kept saying when they graduated, yeah, but what are they going to do next? Mm. And there was just this expectation that eventually the denim would run out. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to be. I mean, I've come out of Marquez shows and heard people being like, oh, I'm a bit disappointed because I really wanted it to be different. And then those same people two weeks later being like, that was my favorite show. Yeah. yeah. Because they just do it so well. Yeah. And you have to get over that hump of like wanting something massive mm. to happen during Fashion Week and yeah. actually just support the designers that do really good stuff. And I think with them, it's such an interesting time for them because they've kind of had that season where they mm. really, really took off and all the buyers picked them up and it kind of moved beyond just kind of press buzz. And it's almost like you want them to kind of own that now and be like, yeah, why would we change our aesthetic? Yes, we do. I think it's really interesting. What did we think of this show? Was this? A I loved the black. I thought it was great. I mean, it's weird that something so simple as like making black metallic denim. Yeah. That to me was what stood out from the whole show. And the jewels I thought were really beautiful. Mm. And the shoes were really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's great. Markers are great. It's interesting because I asked them about this and I want to know what all you guys think because I feel like they've built a brand kind of off a of popular spirit of nostalgia. Why is everyone in, in London, there is this real sense of, kind of, particularly with the young kind of cool labels that we all find exciting, referencing like the 90s, referencing the noughties, referencing old editorials from like The Face and ID and it's kind of this idea of looking a little bit dishevelled in that quite retro sort of pre-internet way feels very com attractive. Is it the comfort? Yeah, I wonder. Or sort of feeling safer, you know, because the world now is so kind of terrifying in so many ways. Mm. Looking back to a time when we weren't sort of looking over our shoulder for an Ebola victim or a <laughs> terrorist or something. Bombarded you know. the whole time. Mm? 
or well, bombarded the whole time with a million different yeah. inspirations. I think that people uh, take those nostalgic moments and periods of time and back issues of the face or ID and reference them because they are so easily cool. Mm, and yeah. to, to me, it frustrates me quite a lot. I don't, I think that there's a time and a pay, place to have historical references and meaning and take something and make derivatives, but push forward, like yeah. go into the new. That's what that's what you will hit. The present is now and look forward to what you're creating for next year and beyond. Mm -hmm. What's done is done. And I think I just see so many young people and I come across them all the time who rely on these um, amazing, old, they worked, cool outfits, pieces of outfits. And I think that that's brilliant. And I, I understand why it's so great, but it's a sort of safety within, well, this is cool because this is way back then. And it was really, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sort of being a bit of an intellectual snob about fashion and I'm only wearing this because it was really, you know, amazing when I was three years old and that's mm -hmm. all I, and I hate it. Do you think it's laziness? Do you think it's the sense of safety and kind of stuff that was all I just think it's cool. being quite stupid. And I don't yeah. think it's very, be, being very open-minded and I don't think it's trusting um, in, what can be created for the future and embracing what is now and thinking about what fabrics designers could be choosing at Premier Vision with a way of looking into workmanship of creating future design. Mm. And I think that, I mean, it happens all the time when I look at shoots in magazines and of course there's always a time for an amazing nostalgic piece. And I think that that's great. And but so often I think that it doesn't work and it's cringy and it's embarrassing and mm. amazing edit editors do it. And it's just cheesy. It's like, I, I don't want to see it. it's difficult, isn't it? Because futuristic stuff, I thought about this a lot this season because everyone was doing slightly light reflecting fabrics. Mm. And, <laughs> and it does just look a bit like, no. Awkward or nothing, it doesn't look, look more very dated. Fashion. Exactly, they no. look more dated. Mm. I think that's such when a good people, point. A lot of the time, people are trying to think future, there and they actually are thinking about seventies future. I think yeah. Yeah. you're right. You're right. Or sixties future, yeah. like yeah. courage yeah. and um, mm. Cardin. I mean, the yeah. only other thing exactly. I would say is, having shot quite a lot of markets, it always looks fresh in editorials. Yeah. As long, I mean, obviously, context is everything, but. I don't shoot this stuff and feel like it looks like I've ripped it off from the face. Like yeah. the fa the white metallic fabrics and stuff like they just feel really fresh and they they look great. Yeah. And I think it's slightly unfair, not that you were, but to tie yeah. them with that kind of nostalgic brush because they are doing really really interesting. Well, it's interesting yeah, they're not. I don't see them yeah. as nostalgic no. at all. No. It's interesting because they said I think it was Paolo that said it, and he just said none of our pieces actually look like they're a piece from the nineties. Really. No, they, no don't. they don't. Which mm, I thought was don't. a really kind of clear way of yeah. putting it. But there is, I think we see a lot of, and I, I do not to, I thought Fashionista was a really interesting show, but there were elements of Fashionista that I looked at and thought this is like remaking costumes from Taboo mm -hmm. and rebranding yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't quite get it. And I thought, am I missing something? I actually thought about it for ages and I was like, because everyone loved it. And I kind of thought, do people just not remember? Is it that, people miss that and they but want to see it again. People want or? young, exciting London designers, so they're kind of willing to give a bit of leeway maybe. But do you think that they kind of want cookie cutter exciting young London yeah, designers? Definitely. Where yeah. it's like, oh you're Learn doing the same easy. thing someone else did twenty years ago, but oh well, like kind of. Maybe, I hope not. <laughs> I don't know whether they want that, but I think I mean you're dealing with really, really young designers. Yeah. And I think it's almost a little bit harsh to evaluate somebody but when they're 25 compared to you know we've no idea what they might go on to do and I think at that age I mean your life experience is so limited on the whole it is quite normal I think to start off with where you came from yeah so that would be the 90s that would be going back yeah um, you're always going to get people who are beyond their years and who, who do just immediately like to live, so just go forward, and that's incredible. Yeah. But I don't think it's a surprise to see young people starting off with something they know. But yeah. you know, actually, Jeremy Scott is guiltier than any young designer of just stealing from the 90s. Yeah. I don't think that we should allow ourselves to slip into talking about how, like, oh my god, these teenagers on Instagram just ripping off the 90s. Right? Jeremy Scott literally ripped off a t-shirt that I had when I was like nine. <laughs> Which yeah. had Barbie on it, and it's, and it's hideous. Mm. Yeah. 
So, I mean, he should probably bear the brunt. No, I don't think it's just a young design thing. I think it's it kind of it's become, as you say, commodified to that point where people are like, okay, this is the thing. Yeah. Let's reproduce it. I'm just Definitely. intrigued as to... But it's really interesting because I know I'm kind of moving off into menswear, so sorry. But I think that's why everyone was so obsessed with Craig Green when he came mm. out because he feels like the only kind of really young designer for ages where it just did feel totally new. That doesn't mean yeah. that it doesn't have aesthetic starting points. There's a massive Japanese yeah. influence there and there's a massive kind of interesting craft. But when you look at it, it just doesn't feel familiar. And I think that's part of the problem with a lot of kind of what we're seeing. But out of men's there, Martine Rose and her stuff's clearly so nostalgic and I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I think she's like the best men's wear in London at the moment. Do you? I'm just like such a Craig devotee. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm like you with J-Dubs. I'm yeah. obsessed mm. with Craig. Love. I think he's the best thing Love ever. Lovely long time. But, um, Look, we're looking at or talking about how designers have to be fresh and new and not, you know, kind of reference the past or the 90s in particular. Where do we slot a designer like Mary Catranzo, for example? Mm. Yeah. Because her shapes or silhouettes may not be radical. Mm -hmm. It's the texture and what she does with fabric and mm. embellishment and embroidery and beading and sort but of I feel what's like on top it's rather the mechanism. than the shape, the method. Yeah. yeah, and that therefore... And that is new. That is new. Mm. And I think that's what, why she has a place and I think that's what is great. Yeah, that's a really good point actually. I think it's interesting there's designers that are about mood and ethos and spirit and then there's designers that are about pieces and I don't think one or the other are more exciting. Mary is a designer that makes great pieces. Mm. You know, I don't think she's not giving you a. Sp there is spirit to her clothes, definitely, and there's definitely emotion and beauty to them. But I don't think she's subscribing to a vision that she's trying to push out there. I think she's making great pieces, and she's incredibly astute as a businesswoman. I think that's definitely to be admi admired. Mm -hmm. Um, did the, everyone kind of went a bit mad for this show? It was really popular. Everyone was saying how amazing it was. Did, were we all really impressed by it? You're yeah. nodding really enthusiastically. Well, really like you're everything explode. about it, you know the. Um, the catwalk was made of, um, I think, was that was it coal or volcanic ash? It was so yeah. black yeah. that had been shipped in from somewhere, and so you had this impression almost of, as if they were kind of walking out of a volcano or mm. a hole in the ground, or you know, some giant sort of earthquake had yeah. happened and left a gaping hole, and the models came out, which set the scene because it was all about sort of tectonic plate shifting and mm. the earth yeah. a couple of million years ago. So that sort of was that was fascinating. And yeah, it was quite wait. an emotional show. I went to the show and it was. I, mean, I love Mary's design. It's not, it's not something at all that I would wear, but there is something about her pieces that are incredibly. Um, yeah, it was a very emotional show. Mm. I don't know why. I think it's because everything was so kind of ornate and it looked very like it could have kind of been made in a studio. It also could have sort of grown on a tree somewhere and yeah. been, like <laughs> slapped on the side of a skirt. It was quite interesting. Were you there, Charlie? Did you have a look at it? No, I didn't go to the show because this was my first season doing digital and it, actually it was a really useful experience because you realise the difference between, like you say, looking at the image images afterwards yeah. compared to being there. It's completely different it's and I think yeah. especially with Mary because yeah. there is that you almost, even at the show, unless you're right, right next to it, you, you don't get a sense of it with Mary's pieces, I think, until you really get to handle it. Yeah. Mm. Um, it was interesting with hers as well because I think there was so much detail at the side and the back, which I love that designers yeah. haven't got to the point where they're so kind of like trampled down by seeing their shows reported online that they've kind of stopped doing that. Yeah, just slap something on the front and see. Yeah. yeah. There was so much detailing in the back. And what do we think about this criticism that's levied at London a little bit that it's kind of too focused just on cocktail dresses? Because that is something that's been kind of. Just depends where you look, really. Yeah. Yeah. It depends who you're looking at and what you're interested in. Because obviously, medium kerchief is not. Cocktail just interesting mm. cocktail dresses. Yeah. God, yeah. please, can they never exactly. do that? But it's interesting how it's, it's <laughs> If awesome. they did do it, it would be amazing. Yeah, it would be amazing. And you yeah. can buy a really, really lovely dress from medium kerchief. Yeah. And like, yeah. 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 Should we have a look at medium kerchief? Oh, yes, please. I'm scared of talking about medium kerchief because I feel like it's so clever that I actually don't even understand. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever get that feeling? Yeah, I always have that when I look at a comm show where I'm like, I should just go and like, sit in a dark room. I've been writing about this for a long time. <laughs> No, it was a really, 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 really amazing show. It was show. brilliant. And I feel like it was a big departure from the last few seasons. Yeah, mm. totally. Yeah, amazing. Amazing casting. Just, like, cuisine thing. So cool. I think it was also interesting just to see, because um, we talked a lot over the season about this kind of, like, sympathetic casting. It's interesting just to go from Mary's show, where everyone made so much of the fact she's older models, and yeah. they're like, isn't this great? And I yeah. do think, great. Yeah. But then you look at this and you're like, oh, that's actually interesting casting. Yeah. You know, like... It's probably more interesting to put this next to Chanel. Mm. Mm. 
What, Just a little thought. What did you think of the Chanel protest, Bertie? I mean, anything that gets people talking is a good thing, but yeah. it, it just, to me, it was so farcical. Yeah. It's just not, mm. it just wasn't right, didn't feel right. Yeah. But then again, loads of think pieces about feminism and fashion came out of it, and that can only be a good thing, as long as they're written by half-intelligent people, mm. which sometimes they are. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't feel like all of it was especially intelligent. No. no. It was weird, actually, because I was away. I woke up nine hours after it had happened, like, what the hell has yeah. happened in Paris? I've been asleep. <laughs> yeah. The world is ending. Yeah. Um, and I didn't go, but my editor was saying that, actually, you kind of got a better sense of it not being there and watching it on a video from the end of the, the runway because yeah. she said if you were sat sort of street side effectively it didn't have the same impact of a street yeah it just kind of looked like a gray runway oh okay um which i think is a shame yeah but then it's interesting to think about shows that are made for like the digital viewer yeah and no. the yeah person could, and I, think I think that definitely was the case that was a show that was to get people talking beyond just that those yeah. fashion people isn't that were it there. so interesting how a show like Medium can draw up so many thoughts and ideas that I'm still a month later thinking about what it all means and Chanel they just write it on a placard and you're yeah. like really mm. really guys that's very mm. true also I didn't think that the messages were or well, some of them were very feminist but some of them actually weren't yeah but the I context remember, wasn't the just the context no. was wrong regardless no. of what the thing even if they were quoting Simone de Beauvoir the context undermines yeah. That little pull but then for how Instagram. does it work that when someone like Medium does it in a fashion show, it works? Because you can make political statements oh, with totally. fashion. Totally, it's just a, I think I don't know. I believe them. Like they have conviction in the way that they design. Yeah, and the references are there, and it's new, but it's it is kind of nostalgic. Well, very nostalgic. Yeah, um, I think in the same way um, Vivian Westwood, which is you know quite timely because her books just mm. come out. I'm yeah. halfway through it at the moment. But her whole fashion life, if you like, has been about yeah. a political message. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting that's actually so And funny. she's so committed and so still, committed. still doing it. I know? get really tired of people because I think that there's been a kind of a bit of a um, spirit towards her. Like, oh, you know, the collections are repetitive, whatever, whatever. And this idea that that's kind of not enough respect for her as a character. And I think she's so amazing. And actually, that was one of the things that made me happiest about the medium show is they unashamedly like love Vivian Westwood mm -hmm. and like, pour through references and like you know those shoes are Westwood shoes yeah. that are there yeah. like they're complete and I and I, they're un, like Ed is, and Ben are unashamedly obsessed with Vivian Westwood I'm really mm. respectful towards her and they think she's amazing and I love that and I think it's really important to kind of honour the greats because I think you can get kind of caught up in London with this thirst for the new and maybe that's what I was touching on with Fashion East is this idea of kind of calling something wonderful just because it was done by a 25 year old yeah. kid yeah. when actually if it was on a runway by someone who'd done it the first time we'd be like oh they're doing that same old thing mm, but then you come out to Martins and you do it and people are like oh yeah. it's just a bit weird <laughs> yeah. like, I, I find yeah. it a bit hard to kind of why, why are we so obsessed with youth in London is that abating I feel like it's we're getting supposed worse. to be the young one yeah. like yeah. London's supposed to be the youngest coolest fashion week mm. and it, it is definitely if you compare it to the other weeks but it's also a little Which bit of a scary Milan title is very youthful. Milan is so young <laughs> no <laughs> I mean we still are yeah. I think the coolest city but is it dangerous to get like I often think that's just in the way that we kind of pull people out and obviously this season isn't the one where you get the amazing student shows but you kind of students have to show on schedule and then mm. we ship them into kind of showing straight away and it, I wonder if it's become we always talk on these panels about the conveyor, conveyor belt of fashion and obviously like as anyone who works in London or works in fashion as you do become kind of weirdly patriotic where you defend yeah. London to the death but I have started to wonder if we're the city that's responsible for that the most with this notion of churning things out and always wanting something new, three seasons showing with fashion needs, on to new day, you know, that kind of sense of like, that relentless pace. pace yeah. mm. Do you think, are we too responsible for that or am I being really unfair? I think we've created an expectation, perhaps, because um, I'm very closely involved with Graduate Fashion Week. Yeah. And just at Graduate Fashion Week alone, there's about a thousand BA fashion graduates represented. Mm, yeah. And that's not counting all the ones who don't make it to Graduate Fashion Week or the universities that can't mm. afford to send, you know, take an exhibition stand. So that's probably 40 universities, all BA fashion graduates, around yeah, about it's a thousand. Scary, that number now people. obviously, there's that number every year, if not more. Mm. Yeah. They can't all be designers. Mm. 
They can't all be stylists. They can't all. Mm. It's terrifying, actually, when you think of the vast quantity yeah. compared to. I mean, even in journalism, it's ridiculous. But I think for design to actually make it big mm. yeah. is perhaps even slimmer. But what is this notion of making it big? I feel like that's what we need to challenge because I think it was mm. a really interesting season, and this is me kind of like. Um, moving away from London a bit, but I feel like it was the season of the kind of um, behind the scenes designer triumphing and you saw that with the appointment at Sonia Rical and you saw that with the appointment at Jill Standard, both of those are designers who have worked in-house for a very long time, you know, mm. like cut their teeth for sort of 10 years behind the scenes mm. at you know, Prada and Vuitton respectively mm -hmm. and I think that's really, really interesting to see because you could contrast that with J.W. Anderson in a way yeah. where that was obviously an appointment for like a young star with a name. Mm. But I think it's interesting to show that actually there are multiple pathways, that you don't have to kind of come out straight away and do your... And I think it was interesting to see that in the big European cities and to see that in this kind of real... in two really important mm. houses. And I wonder if that's going to make people more inclined to kind of think, actually, I'll go away and do a few years in-house. And I really feel like we should encourage that more, but I just don't I, know. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. 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 But it's hard to encourage because there is this focus that to make it, you have your own name. And if you... But everyone's a bit sick of that, like, oh my god, the show that blew up and went everywhere, and yeah. then every mm. now and next season no one gives a shit. One hit mm. wonder. Exactly. Mm. I think people are becoming increasingly wary of that. Mm. I think people are also increasingly aware of the fact that there isn't one pathway. Yeah. Because especially yeah. even within journalism, you know, you look at, I feel like there's more and more people coming from high-level PR and automatically swapping into an executive fashion Is role. that a good thing? I don't know, but it, at least it's offering another pathway into it. Yeah, there is. You're right. Actually, it's really interesting. There's about a lot that, more yeah. movement between PR and, and journalism. I think well, even like before. Oh, thank you. Even like commerce and journalism. And yeah, people lots who of different go from routes. Being fashion editors or mm -hmm. fashion like um, fashion yeah. writers to being. You know, heading up the like women's wear department. Yeah. Yeah. But I know when we when we graduated from the masters, we automatically thought, oh god, we've got to be on a great title, and you do yeah. because if you're really ambitious, you want to be a great journalist. You think, well, I need to get into a great place because that sort of becomes part of you and part of your brand and part of what you want to achieve. But actually, there are some incredible fashion journalists who started out on their own who haven't had a big brand behind them. Yeah. Um, actually, we were talking about Pandora before we came on. Pandora Sykes. She was a blogger. Mm. She did, what, eight months at the debrief, mm. and now she's moved into the fashion features editor of Sunday Time Style. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that we are going to see a lot more of that, where you don't automatically leave as a student one of the thousands mm. yeah. and go, oh my god, I've got to get the top job right this second, otherwise that's my career in fashion over. But I, I worry, and this is me being like really conservative, but I'm kind of like unashamedly quite conservative about this, mm. so I, Bring it I worry that we're making fashion journalists about people who write about their personal shopping and I think those yep. are two very no, different it's two, things. it's that and oh, then it's fashion dreadful. journalists that will be in the pocket of big brands. Yeah. yeah. So we're stuck, we're so stuck now, I think it's such a shame. Yeah. yeah. That's why it's so amazing to have people like Alex Fury because yeah. it's yeah. just that honesty, is, it's, it's the only interesting thing about fashion yeah. journalism And also me. it's yeah. interesting. I just don't care about anything else. Yeah. But it's so, it's, there's so many journ great journalists that come out of writing posts about what they themselves oh God, wear. Yeah. And that's yeah. not ju fashion cares. journalism. Why would you ever care? Yeah. Like, people do care now. That's people do care. Yeah, that's, that's a scary really, thing. really, really scary. And I think, you know, there is a space for that. Sure, cool, good for that. Mm. But I worry that you're not encouraging those kind of graduates that you were just talking about, Hillary, mm. to, to think, no, don't kind of write about the coat you've just bought. No. Like, yeah. write I mean, about I went to, something um, else. I went to LCF. <laughs> I spoke to some third year fashion journalism students. And, th like, they were all terrified of actually having a voice. Yeah. Because mm. the minute you honestly have a voice, you f you're told that you're pigeonholing yourself. Yeah. yeah. So rather than being honest about what they think, they're kind of trying to, like, get on side with different brands or get yeah. on side with different magazines. And that to me is such a shame. I and really it slows you down. It's really it's more, it's more or less PR. It yeah, is yeah, it is. Entirely We PR. had that this season. We did a student panel, um, which we always do every season. We get a bunch of amazing students in from like LCF, Central St. Martins, like, so lots of different universities around London, and we get them to analyse one of the shows in exactly the same setup. And I'm always, I'm, I've never not been impressed by them. I think they're always so, so amazing. This is the machine show. Yeah, yeah, and we did it for the machine And they were amazing. Yeah, but I really noticed when they started, and they all admitted to doing it. And I thought it was really, really intriguing. They, they all said they liked it when I first said, what do you think about what he's doing there? And they kind of, as the panel progressed, they kind of <laughs> were like, oh, yeah, but we wouldn't want to say we didn't like it because this is going to be online. Then we, we try and get jobs that look... And so they were yeah. already yeah. editing themselves in the yeah. way they knew they'd have yeah. to if they went and worked for, like, you know, ID or Days or, mm. like, Vogue or whoever, where 
that could be an advertiser. And I thought, yeah. in one way, it really made me respect them. I was like, you're so careerist and you're so ambitious, you're so smart to think like that, to think, you know, I need to present myself to the same standards as a journalist working for a title I want to work for. Mm-hmm. But it's so scary when you think that we're already teaching young people to kind of think that they can't have an opinion because they won't work I in the fashion like industry. If you're not being honest, then you're not a real journalist. Yeah. That's not journalism to me. No, but I think that's the issue. The role of fashion journalism has changed considerably. Mm. When I started as a fashion journalist, I mean, it happened about 30 odd years ago, you were not even supposed to use the word I. That was considered yeah. so bad, oh, uh, yeah. 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 so really naff yeah. and cheesy. Now the biggest but feedback I. I get from pieces when I'm freelancing is like, more of you in it. <laughs> really? Yeah, I hate yeah. it. I'm like, I love it. it. <laughs> You're like, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Like, right about about that's what it should be. Yeah. That is really what it should be. In a way, that's the beauty of being a freelancer. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, often actually, Alex is great because he does have this incredible voice that I don't think you could quell, even if you tried. Yeah. But lots of people, you know, they do bow to power above and powers that be, and there's an advertising presence, and that, you know, it's a business decision. I also think it's interesting, and this is going very industry, but the way that appointment, appointments are made and you know if a big title is looking for a new fashion features editor or a new fashion they will go and talk to the PRs and say who do you like yeah. who is good God, who can yes. you recommend and Definitely. I think that's really worth flagging because it makes yeah. it it does mean you love Alex and I think he's amazing mm-hmm. and I think it's such a credit to him that he's done so well but mm. like if you're starting out and you're known as like a really kind of vocal maverick crazy journalist yeah. and whoever's looking for a new fashion feature editor and the PRs will hate you, they're not going to be like, oh yeah, give them a go. Yeah. Like, you know, so it's quite worrying. It's incredible. I, it's I mean, it's a small industry anyway, but you, the longer you're in it, you start to realise that actually it's not just references from your immediate editor, from your previous editor. No. It's anybody you've ever had a drink with at a fashion event because yeah. everybody talks. Yeah. And, and that tweets. Must and tweets. Yeah. And that must be as well really scary to that generation of young graduates coming into it because they're like, well, where do I start with this? Yeah. You know, they're not in that circle. Um, they're not being recommended by, you know, PR of XYZ. Mm. It's really, really hard to break into that now. So in summary, we all hate the fashion yeah. industry. It's like we always have these panels and we get really depressed. I don't know, we should keep talking about medium to like check yeah, ourselves Because they've done that well, they've bucked, yeah. they, they oh, haven't well, they conformed, yeah, you know, and they've refused to kind of like but that, yeah, bow to pressure. I was looking at that, um, the picture on the right, see with the big shirt, hmm. and is it trousers, it look, I mean, hmm. it looks really very like Vivian's Pirates collection. Yeah, but it, it is does. unashamedly referencing Vivian, I don't yeah. think they would be. In, I wonder, I'd be interesting to find out, you know, what she thought of it. Yeah. Mm. yeah well, She's probably not, a, I'm sure she is aware of Medium Kirchhoff. I actually spoke to Ed about this this weekend, yeah. Ed Medium, and I said, like, if you met Vivian, if you asked her what she think, and we were kind of laughing about it, and he was like, she'd probably just be like, oh, it's really boring. <laughs> and he kind of <laughs> found that quite great. Yeah. Which, um, but I kind of, there's, there is a real humility to what they do in a way, mm, and I yeah. think they unashamedly love Vivian, but I actually don't think they really care if, like, she thinks it's great, or yeah. you know, other people yeah. who love Vivian think it's great. It's just they love Vivian and they yeah. want to put that in there because it's what they believe in. And I kind of love that kind of precision of vision. That's and that's the thing is, that as, I think as a young designer, it's easier to do that than a young journalist because oh, yeah, they put out so. there exactly more or less what they want, obviously depending on the financial situation, but it is different. And like you say about having a voice, those boys have really found their voice mm. yeah. and they're, they're yeah. going for it. Whereas actually, we had an intern recently who has been, she's a great girl, she's been writing a blog for four years without ever publishing it. Really? What yeah. does that mean? I guess she saved everything as a draft for four years. Or you could just a diary. It. You can make Effectively. It oh my God. But she, when I said, you know, oh my God, you've got to let us read it, she mm-hmm. said, I don't know if it's any good. And I was like, well, you know, if there's an appetite for it, you'll soon find that out. And if not, yeah. get the rest of our team to read it and we'll have a look. But that should so be encouraged, this notion of like writing every day, but not like writing every day for hits and yeah. writing every day for people to like. But it was like that fear you. of exposing that voice yeah. was so immense. You're quite trapped, aren't you? Yeah. I think as a young journalist now, you're yeah. quite trapped mm. because it's. You don't want to have like some shitty blog, which I had and mm. really regret anyone ever having read. But you also don't want to have no exposure at all because mm-hmm. then you're just going to go through the prescribed channels and come out the other end and be like, But I noticed that there's quite a big backlash I found with them, some of the like amazing interns that we get here where they don't have Twitter or they don't have yeah. Yeah. like social media and I think mm-hmm. there is that sense of kind of like pulling back until you're completely sure in what you have to say. Yeah. Which I think mm. in a I way yeah, it's sad, sure. that climate of fear, but then also I think, you know, 
smart on them and so, you know it's a really good idea in some ways because you don't want to write some like a big bunch of kind of like crap if drivel yeah when you're kind of 17 and you don't know what you know mm. you might have complete conviction in what you're saying so it's quite an interesting yeah. one i actually had a similar situation whereby i wrote something as a student and it was for sort of independent magazine that had barely launched and it was then published they didn't publish it at the time but they published it about three years later but without checking oh, oh my god, god. So good. And I read it and was like, oh my god, like, these are people I now work with and can, like, oh communicate god. with regularly. Like, my opinions in the space of three, four years yeah. would completely change. Yeah. And I think if you've been in the industry years and years and years, obviously that will gradually t- tame down, I think. But that's another thing we're talking about, how hard it is for young journalists, but I also think that's worth mentioning of young designers, that now if you were starting out, all your collections are on the internet. Yeah. You, know, you can't find lots of... Pasc- even like trying to find early Christopher Kane collections you can't find all of them she's really interesting about this what does she, she do they, I don't know she's very funny about people taking pictures of her collections or yeah. anything she says she's had really bad experiences where people have filmed at her presentations and made their own little films of it with their own soundtrack and she really felt like it was totally taken away from her in a really negative way yeah. and so now often she'll just release a specific set of images like Ollie Perp no Tom Ordoina shot a series of images, I think it was two seasons ago, and then they just released that. And it, that's mm. like a very kind of savvy way yeah, of doing it's quite it. Control, yeah, it's isn't it? really clever. But I do think it's really, really hard because I do think what do you do if you're a young designer in that respect? Because you can't really grow, you don't have that time to, as you say, control yeah. what is seen of yours. But also, like, make mistakes because it's always mm. going to be so easily Googleable. Mm. Google- Googleable. <laughs> in the same thing, I think that there will be in the next few years a new frame with which yeah. there'll be the new Instagram or whatever, the, the way that things are archived or documented. I mean, mm. I, I know that people often don't really even use so much Google Images as a reference anymore. Some people use, um, they hashtag and just use the hashtag of the, whatever it is they're looking for and put it into Instagram and yeah. that's their search engine for images now. Yeah. So I sort of think that, I mean, God willing, some things may, you know, some things that maybe you're not so proud about, whatever, could be lost or with the new technology that will come about. And so things won't be so locked in. And I think, like, Mm. even this, I hope that soon, because constantly the way that fashion is photographed at shows, and it's that thing of it's so different when you're there in person. Mm, Yeah. There's got to be, I don't know, sometimes I think that. Have the designers really thought about where the photographer pit is? Because the way that it's Mm. photographed, where the light's hitting it, it looks terrible Mm. and it doesn't even look like that really. And all these things I I think think will develop. They have to. What you just said about Instagram was really interesting because I think it's almost even like post-style.com now where designers aren't actually worried about how it's going to look on Mm. like Vogue.com or Studio or style.com. They're Mm. worried about how it's going to look on Instagram. Mm. So it almost kind of doesn't matter where the photographer's pit is now because... Mm catwalk images are less important than Instagram images now. Right. Do you know what I mean? And that's why on Show Studio we always have the catwalk images, but underneath it we have like a gallery of kind of all the social media from the show. Yeah. Because na- now that tells a better story and the pictures are better. Yeah, some of them, yeah, are terrible blurry catwalk shots. Yeah. But a lot of them tell more of the kind of, you know, at this show there was like trees covered with like tampons covered in blood. And you don't see that from the catwalk images and that was such a big part of that show. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of, it is that interesting idea where it's even like moving so fast that the catwalk images now, like, there's a lot of talk I know about 360 catwalk images, but I kind of think, you know, you're too late. We've moved on to Instagram now. Mm. I interviewed like, Gareth Pugh and he said he wanted to do some sort of like hologram 3D, like goggles where you can walk around <laughs> the show. I was like, that sounds amazing. Amazing. We have yeah. one of those That's things in the wish. office actually. I don't oh my know God, they make me so work. sick. Where have you, you put, yeah, you put on these goggles and you're in like a virtual it's space. So and I was like in this weird how the weird things happen at show studio. I was like going up. Like, <laughs> A house. It was really scary. What was it called? Oculus Rift. Yes, I don't, that's Oculus it. Rift. O- can it what? Oculus, Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift. Thank you, Liam. It's like a beautiful <laughs> house on a lake. Yeah, it was. Grass and I found I, like, it really, really vomit. scary. It was very nauseous. It was but I think that what an amazing like way to do a fashion show. Yeah, Imagine if you just had like a booth with a hundred of those and anyone could go and experience your fashion show yeah. like that. It would be yeah. amazing. And I feel like we need to be thinking. It's so interesting what you just said, Talita. I totally agree. Thinking like beyond technology, beyond where we're at now. It's like too late to make the catwalk images more show the back. It's like, yeah. well done. Like, do you know, it's, it's got to be thinking that kind of like... I think yeah, one of the, Oh, sorry, no, go. No, no, I just want to say, I don't think you can discount the photographer's pit because when you think about it, it's only the photographer's pit that is 
facing mm. where the, mo the models are walking sure. towards you. Mm. Yeah, Everyone sure. else with their camera phone gets side. a side on, yeah. which is so deceiving, mm. and so deceptive, mm. so you get a kind of strange sideways view, mm. so you never really mm. see the front. Mm. Or if you try and get the front, it's too far away, yeah. Yeah. or the light's just hitting it, so the whole thing just dissolves in a big yeah. blur of yellow light. So, in a sense, the photographers who are doing shooting straight down the cap, mm. straight down the barrel, yeah, are the ones getting the best image. And Medium yeah. did use that very effectively. The season with the full frontal male nudity mm. we saw in the show. What did we think? Which wouldn't about? have been the same but if we shot find the inside. Full frontal male nudity. <laughs> Why are you smiling at me like that? And um, what did we think about that? Because I thought it was a really interesting idea of what makes us shockable and what makes like what's still shocking and what's not. You mean because if it was a woman, it wouldn't have been as shocking. Yeah, I think so. But also, I wonder if it would be as shocking. But I don't, he's wearing see-through it, trousers. It is more shocking. <laughs> You've looked at this a lot, haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> I love this shit. No, go up, go up. We'll find. Because a guy in... Think there, it, was it that one? I is think it it's one? this one. No, maybe... It, it was like sheer no. trousers, so it's probably quite hard to see on the screen. Or it's just because the image doesn't pick it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so depressing. Because we need another way. Yeah. Yeah. We need yeah. a telescope. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Poor guy. Wow. <laughs> flat, flat. Okay, <laughs> guys, <laughs> let's talk about penises. Yeah. But do, because there was a lot of attention around that, which is interesting, because I, I really subscribe to this belief that it's hard to shock at a fashion show anymore, and then I was kind of at that show, and I saw that. <laughs> Were you shocked? No, I actually wasn't, because it didn't. It was done in a really, really clever way where it didn't look remotely gimmicky. You weren't like, oh, that's there to be shocking. I just kind of noticed it and I was like, oh right, cool. And I actually didn't really think about it afterwards. It was only afterwards when there was so much about it that I started to think about it and be like, oh, is that shocking and why is it shocking? I think it's just very interesting when you think about in a, the context of women doing it, mm. like no knickers, it's kind of something that you joke about or it's a, it's a saying that you would say fairly often. Mm. Like if you were talking about someone like, oh, I'll probably have to wear no knickers with that dress. It's not, it's not that unusual. So placing that into, the, into a male context, yeah. What does that mean? Does that mean something different, or is he literally just trying to avoid a VPL? Or like, yeah. what does that say about gender stereotypes? Yeah. What was the purpose of the nakedness? I think that makes a difference. To I, just, I don't think it needs to have a purpose. I, don't, yeah, I, I, I think, think the it, fact that it happened is really interesting because it sparks again a conversation, but mm, a far yeah. more interesting. Conversation. I think you're so right with this idea. It's totally normal. Like, so at the Mary Chansey show, there were sheer panels on the side and. To be honest, I didn't look that closely, but I, I presume a lot of the girls just didn't wear underwear with yeah. it because it was full mm. sheer panels. Yeah. And no one was like, no underwear at the, Mead, at the Mary Catranzi show. Exactly. Then Meaden, who's wearing a sheer pair of like kind of tracksuit bottom type trousers, so he didn't wear underwear. And it was kind of a similar context, mm. but... I guess it's not full frontal with the Mary thing though, is it? No, but it's, it's still this but notion of like... you see boobs like, a lot. Yeah, yeah. you know, like... We, we kind of breeze past that in the Marcus Almeida show, you know, yeah. girls, sheer... Yeah, we so wouldn't even blink, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, you don't even, you're not... Yeah. I think that was quite an interesting idea of male, I think it's about gender. Yeah. Do you know, it's quite interesting on this subject, that at Tom Ford... Oh, can we talk about Tom Ford? Towards the end, there actually were a couple of models with nipple pasties. Yeah. Like sheer and kind of crystal pasties. Yeah, there were crystals on, actually, on, the, on. on it the was nipples. almost like makeup, wasn't it? And okay. it actually looked sort of, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> It really did, because it sort of takes you back to, I don't know. And Summers. But it reminded me when Gutier did it, but like, did it in, you know, when he did like the kind of like beading to show mm. like pubic hair and nipples, and yeah. it was like amazing. And I looked at it, but there was none of the kind of warmth and wit mm. and kind mm. of joyful like. Um, I went to see that at the at exhibition. Oh, look, there it is. I didn't see them. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that, that Gautier dress is hilarious. It's a yeah. huge, like, sort of mound of black <laughs> beading, and it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. Yeah. And Chanel once did a bikini with the C's, uh, tie, the the tiny, 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 with the tiny yeah. little CC yeah. on each nipple. Yeah. So that was more witty in yeah. a way. But was whereas this, there, yeah, there wasn't much humour in this, really. Was no, it? this didn't feel very um, witty. No, it didn't. What do we think of it? Tom Ford. I don't think it is though. That's what I think. That's my mm. biggest problem with it. Is I love. I think Tom Ford is amazing. I love mm. what he did. I think he's incredible. I'm like endlessly intrigued by him. But it is still that kind of '90s, yeah, late '80s, '90s vamp, isn't mm. it? Yeah. The urban 
But I don't think she's a fan. Killer. She doesn't feel like in control. His Gucci woman, she was, I know yeah. she was regressive in many ways, looking back, and when you look at it through a kind of the lens we mm. have now, but I think she felt like she was in control. Mm. And there was a slight kind of, she was active, whereas this woman, there was something about her, maybe it was the shoes, maybe it was I think it was the she shoes. She felt passive. Definitely, like yeah. She felt like she needed to be on someone's arm. or she oh, yeah, like, Candy. Like she, she couldn't kind of like stomp into a room and stomp out again. No. She'd like toddle into a room and sit on a sofa. And could she afford to pay for the dresses herself? Mm. That was another thing that I kind of... But does that feel like a new thing for this season? Oh no, I think it's his exactly. oldest time. That's, that's I think he... Has Tom Ford fascinates me as a, as a designer over the long term and I think exactly what you say, what he's done is incredible, but I don't think for a long time this label has really been that different. I mean, I guess you would put it up against Saint Laurent because they are very similar. Yeah. But I love Saint Laurent and when Do I you? see Yeah, I mean it took me a while, it took me a few seasons, and now I feel like very refreshed by it when I see it. It mm. feel I mean, I think the models that they cast are too thin, but I think that about so many people anyway. Yeah. Um but it has kind of references to things which aren't fashion, mm -hmm. but all of that musical heritage which Hedy Samain obviously is obsessed with, he's so obsessed with it, comes through. Whereas with this, I'm not sure what it is that we're supposed to be taking from it. It's not like they're girls in bands that also do other stuff that he's roped in to get to walk for him or like, I just don't, I don't get it. Mm. But don't forget also, um, there's Hedy's version of exactly. Saint Laurent, there's Tom Ford's version of Saint Laurent, mm. there's Albert Elbaz's version of oh, Saint Laurent God. and then there's Saint Laurent himself. Mm. Mm. It's a different ball game. And Stefano Pilati. Hmm? <laughs> Stefano Pilati. Oh, it's all good as well. Forgot. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, did you like it, Salula? You're looking quizzically at it. <laughs> <laughs> just know that one of those jackets is going to fit so sublimely that, mm. and I know that, mm. you know, but I, I, this is, I wish, not that it could happen, that designers would take seasons out and would go, you know what, I haven't really thought enough. <laughs> yeah. I don't really. I can I. I can't. I'm not ready. A gap year. Mm, yeah. A gap season. Wouldn't that be so exciting? Like waiting to see so who was going to show each season. Yeah. You know, waiting really for the cool, list yeah. to come out. Because yeah. I think that I wish Tom Ford would make another movie. Mm. And I wouldn't be in it. Like yeah. I think that there are other. You know, just have a. I think that sometimes like it's what you said earlier. The rigmarole that everybody in every everywhere has to go into, and I I just wish that that existed i wish that buyers and therefore the customer whatever would go you know what that is fine because i trust that you will have better designs they'll be more concise they'll be more considered because you've had the time to rework and think through things yeah and actually then my customer will be really excited to hopefully buy more yeah. because it's better yeah because there's just been more time to go through things and mm. that should you know if i was in charge of You're queen fashion. of fashion. <laughs> I would enforce that. That's like, such a good idea. I really yeah, like you fixed idea, really fashion. That would be so exciting. Imagine, you know, like when you wait to find if you're being cast in the school play and the list goes <laughs> up on the wall. It'd be like that, like waiting to hear who's going to show. And you can imagine everyone would be like, oh my God, Christopher Kane's going to show this season. Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. It would be amazing. Yeah. But then yeah. equally, I don't have a problem with labels like this because there is a woman who, you know, if I had this lifestyle whereby I needed a sequined cocktail dress, a different mm. one every week, it'd be great. But I just... Who are those people? But also, they exist? it worries me that we say I don't have a problem with it because there's a market for it. Mm. Because then it's like, well, yeah, there is, but there will always be a market for it as long as you stop catering to that and you try and push that, wo that woman into something that is slightly more respectful to her or slightly more... But we're more not necessarily dealing with women who are fashion thinking, they're, they're lifestyle thinking. Yeah. But then is that who they should be designing for? That's mm. not really well, what I'm interested in. It depends on their motivation. Mm. But if also, all the more reason to, to encourage that woman to... You know, I don't think you have to be a fashion educated woman to want something that is, um, I don't know, like forward thinking and respectful and open minded and progressive. And I think it's dangerous when we're like, oh, but there's a big, you know, like Russian clientele that will love this. Mm. And you see that kind of like basically almost said in so many fashion reviews. And I find yeah. that quite offensive. It's a really, firstly, really dismissive to kind of the intelligence of that shopper, but also mm -hmm. this idea that like uh, will be bought, thus let's make it, and that's an excuse for it. 
But we can't all wear, you know, Com or JW. Yeah. Oh, but if we could. Some of us we could. You know. There is a realism, I think, that has to come into play. Yeah. Just I, just, I really want to pick up on this notion of time, because I am actually conscious of time, but also time. Um, because I think that really came through in Christopher Kane's collection. We talked about this on our New York, New York panel, this notion of a lot of designers who are revisiting their own classics or revisiting their own design history. And Christopher Kane um, talked quite sort of openly about how he was exploring ideas that came from his um, research when he was a student mm. and ideas that he'd come across and he wanted to explore but then didn't perhaps have the time to when he was at Central St Martins. Mm. And I thought that was really, really interesting because in many ways I felt like this was a season of designers like um, celebrating themselves, weirdly, you know, drawing on their own archives. Um, but what does it say about fashion when one of our most exciting kind of ideas men doesn't have any new ideas? I'm sure he does have new ideas, but he's drawing on his old ideas. Is there something, is that a comment on the pace of fashion from but him, do we think, or am I just reading too much into that? But don't think, don't forget also, you know, that he did dedicate it to Louise. Absolutely. And yeah. in some respects, perhaps he was in a lot more of a sober and reflective mood because her death was, you know, mm, profoundly huge, huge loss, yeah. shocking and a huge loss. And perhaps he wanted to just be more remember reflective and remember yeah. you know everything she taught him or the things they discussed mm. or because he did say a lot to her you know about the sketches that he'd done and you know with Tammy and Louise mm. and talking about so perhaps it was his way of quietly you know thanking the woman who mm. was you know his biggest inspiration as, mm. a, as a student. It's funny there was something we were saying earlier about Mary I can't remember what it was but again same thing where I thought could it be that because mm. those I mean, those students are just so profoundly influenced by her. Mm. I don't think they could have gone into this season, you know, even if it wasn't necessarily in the collection, I'm certain that when they started those shows, it was on their minds. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I'd be surprised if it wasn't there throughout the process of designing it. But also, I guess that time was on their minds, you know, her, but also the, the climate that she created in that college of like constantly pushing yourself and yeah. constantly searching for ideas. And I wonder if kind of reflecting on that makes you reflect on how there's not that many opportunities to operate like mm. that in the fashion system that we put designers in. You, know, you don't have that much time to kind of consider and consider and consider an idea until you're driving yourself practically yeah. bonkers, but you know everything about it. And it's I, a really formative time. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's and not that many professors like Louise. Exactly. You know, with that absolutely sort of ball-breaking bravado, you know, <laughs> yeah. just... Yeah, just, yeah, total... Mm brilliant mania that was amazing it was obsession almost yeah. Yeah. you know and I think to have somebody especially you know these guys were still presenting their collections she was still in the audience yeah mm. to have that obsession continue and support continue to then break out on your own not through choice you know yeah. through through not having a choice in it at all that's that's scary I'm sure mm. I do also think talking about um, Christopher King referencing himself it was, it's very clever, it's very commercial, and it's very honest what he did with his bags, because mm. he put those seatbelt buckles on his bags. And that is what a lot of people still think of when they think Christopher Kane. Yeah. They think that graduate collection with the mm. seatbelt buckles, and he took that and put it, and bags mm. are there to sell, to make money. Mm. Yeah. So it's clever, and it's honest, and, mm. and they're amazing bags. So. Yeah. yeah. I think he's a brilliant designer. I think he's such an interesting one when it comes to this kind of like, this new way I think people are seeing London where they see it as a city with like real sort of might and relevance and importance and not just a place to go to kind of like laugh at someone wearing like an ode to Lee Bowery but to go and kind of be like amazed by someone like J.W. Anderson who's kind mm. of taking over the fashion world now or someone like Christopher Kane it's an interesting one and even just like you see that with all the stores opening at the moment it's so exciting obviously that's very apt with Christopher Kane who's mm -hmm. opening his store but Roxanne mm -hmm. just opened her one mm -hmm. on Mount Street and even like from the men's where you've got E-Torts opening on um, What's it called? Um, the street by Selfridges. Can't remember. Duke um, Street. Duke Street, exactly. Um, and it's such an exciting time in that respect, isn't it? Is there I think what's interesting too is that we talk about you know how the designers, that, you know, especially like Christopher Kane and you know, um, John, Jonathan Saunders, etc., are sort of growing up, and then think that there are all those members of the international press and the buyers yeah. who've actually grown up. They've seen that progress. Yeah. Because Anna Winter and you know, the yeah. people from um, you know, Holt Renfrew and Sachs and Bloomies and Cathy Horn and and us, you know what I mean? We've sort of been there 
and mm. grown up with them. No, it's right. It's interesting. I think that's why there's such warmth to someone like Simone Rocher who's doing so well mm. because you, when you look at her collections, you're like, they're so amazing, but you're also mm. like, you remember her graduate yeah, collection. Yeah. You kind oh. of feel like her mum because you remember that sense <laughs> of being like, I'm well done for mine. But I think it's really nice. And I think that's why London it has that kind of, for all the criticism we were saying about the fetishization of the kind of young designer and the kind of real pressure of making students show on schedule. Yeah. It is amazing in a way because it does generate this kind of warmth and emotion towards mm -hmm. the designers that I think other cities, maybe you just don't have towards the young talent that you see there because you don't know where they've come from. You don't remember yeah. the kind of the mistakes and the, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm conscious of time. Is there anyone we've missed? Because we just, we just very briefly mentioned Simone, but we haven't talked about sibling. We haven't talked that much about Erdem. There were lots of amazing shows. Were there any other standouts or was it just a good season all round? Alice Temple. Oh, Marque oh Marquesa mm. coming back. No, oh, that's true. Yeah. Marquesa coming back to celebrate their 10th anniversary. Mm. Mm. Didn't which Alex was all very hate that. <laughs> Woodstock hit <hippie, laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Lovely. Yeah. It's not really. I think it's red carpet dressing. Of course he hates it. But you. you <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of predictable that he was going to hate it. Yeah, and you do need that. I think there's a like you need those, and also you need those big brands to show in London. Yeah. Like, I think you have to be kind of like pragmatic about it in a way. It's just like when you scroll through, there's so many people we haven't talked about, which I'm really, really conscious of. Ryan Lowe was incredible. Congratulations, Yay. Bertie. Bye. Who styled Ryan Lowe. It's very great. And J.S. Lee. and Yeah. Um, yeah there's so many people, weren't there, when you think about and it? And the Temple, um, Alice Temple's collection. I really yeah, loved yeah, it. So it, was, it, it was, yeah. Sort really of nice. Bedouin, you know, the yeah. wonderful prints. It was seriously really, really, I really lovely. really loved it. Yeah. So was it a strong season then? Were we impressed? Mm. I was. I felt uplifted, I think, is the word. Yeah. By so many. Do you think so it felt many. happier, maybe? Mm -hmm. Do you think it felt happier? Mm. It felt, I don't know, to me it just felt a little bit less serious. Mm. But not going so far to the extreme of, you know, intense humour and humour for the sake of it. It just felt a little bit lighter, almost. Yeah. Perhaps that's because it was spring-summer, in a way, mm. you know. Mm. The se you know, season, seasonal clothes yeah. are a lot lighter. Mm. But I, I just felt a sense of, I don't know, um, joy. Joy. Mm. Mm. Joy. What a nice note to end on, there a sense go. of joy. Should we give everyone a round of applause? Because they've given us lots of food for thought, haven't they? So, fantastic. Who season. did you give three claps to before? Because that was hilarious. I'm trying to remember. What? You gave like three little bitchy claps to someone. No. Maybe Jeremy Scott. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I'll give more than three claps now, though. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, guys.